This is Goldilocks. She is called Goldilocks because of her sproingy locks of golden hair. Goldilocks is an expert at skipping. Usually, Goldilocks likes to skip around the pond, but today she decided to skip through the forest. Along the path, she noticed the cutest, coziest cottage she had ever seen. I wonder who lives in such a cute, cozy cottage, Goldilocks thought. Goldilocks skipped to the cottage for a closer look. She knocked on the door and was disappointed when no one answered. Then it hit her. The most wonderful smell she had ever smelled. Porridge, Goldilocks said dreamily as her stomach rumbled. That smell is making me hungry. I don't think anyone would mind if I went in for a quick taste. She opened the door to the cottage. After all that skipping, Goldilocks was starving. Goldilocks went to the table where she found three bowls of porridge. She tasted the first bowl. Too sweet, she said. Then she tasted the middle bowl. Too cinnamony, she said. Finally, she tasted the last bowl. It was just right. Wow, this is delicious porridge, she said. After all that skipping and eating, Goldilocks wanted to sit down. Goldilocks looked around the cozy cottage and noticed three chairs. She sat in the first chair. Too hard, she said. Then she sat in the middle chair. Too cushiony, she said. Finally, she sat in the last chair. It was just right. This is the most comfortable chair ever, she said. After all that skipping and eating and sitting, Goldilocks was feeling sleepy. She went into the next room and saw three beds. She flopped onto the first bed. Too firm, she said. Then she flopped onto the middle bed. Too pillowy, she said. Finally, she flopped onto the last bed. It was just right, she said. Meanwhile, three bears came in the door. That was a fine skip through the forest, said the papa bear. It's good to be home, said the mama bear. I'm hungry, said the little bear. The bears went over to the table where they noticed something was different about their porridge. Somebody's been eating my porridge, said the papa bear. And somebody's been eating my porridge, said the mama bear. Hey, my porridge is almost gone, said the little bear. The bears ate what was left of their porridge and then went to sit down. They noticed something was different about their chairs. Somebody's been sitting in my chair, said the papa bear. And somebody's been sitting in my chair, said the mama bear. Hey, my chair looks like a person, said the little bear. After all that skipping and wondering about porridge and chairs, the bears were sleepy and they headed to bed. They noticed something was different about their beds. Somebody's been flopping in my bed, said the papa bear. And somebody's been flopping in my bed, said the mama bear. Hey, there's a girl in my bed said the little bear. Goldilocks opened one eye, then the other. She saw three bears staring at her. Hello, said the little bear. We're the bears that live here. You are, said Goldilocks, wide-eyed. Did you know that you had the best porridge, chair, and bed in the whole world? I think so, too, said the little bear. You don't mind that I tried them? Asked Goldilocks. No, I don't mind, said the little bear. Let's play. The little bear invited Goldilocks to stay, and they laughed and had pillow fights all morning long. The toy.
Tortoise and the Hare. A speedy hare lived in the woods. She was always bragging to the other animals about how fast she could run. The animals grew tired of listening to the hare, so one day the tortoise walked slowly up to her and challenged her to a race. The hare howled with laughter. Race you? <laughs> I can run circles around you, the hare said, but the tortoise didn't budge. Okay, tortoise, you want a race? You've got it. This will be a piece of cake. The animals gathered to watch the big race. A whistle blew and they were off. The hare sprinted down the road while the tortoise crawled away from the starting line. The hare ran for a while and looked back. She could barely see the tortoise on the path behind her. Certain she'd win the race, the hare decided to rest under a shady tree. The tortoise came plodding down the road at his usual slow pace. He saw the hare, who had fallen asleep against a tree trunk. The tortoise crawled right on by. The hare woke up and stretched her legs. She looked down the path and saw no sign of the tortoise. <sighs> I might as well go win this race, she thought. As the hare rounded the last curve, she was shocked by what she saw. The tortoise was crossing the finish line. The tortoise had won the race. The confused hare crossed the finish line. <sighs> wow, tortoise, the hare said. I really thought there was no way you could beat me. The tortoise smiled. I know. That's why I won. For more songs and stories, check out our other videos. Hi, this is Katie Huffman. I'll be reading The Ugly Duckling. One summer, in a beautiful country barnyard, a duck sat upon a nest of eggs, waiting and waiting for them to hatch. The duck was very lonely, because all of the other ducks who lived on the farm were swimming and playing in the pond. They just didn't want to sit in the hot sun with the duck and wait for the eggs to hatch. Finally, the eggs began to crack, and the little baby ducklings poked their heads through the broken eggshells and started to cry out, Quack! Quack! Upon hearing the sound, a very old duck came along to check on the mother duck. Hello, mother duck! I see your eggs have hatched. Well, yes, they have, and I am so happy. Aren't these the most beautiful ducklings you have ever seen? But this last egg still has not hatched. The mother duck moved aside so that the old duck could see the remaining egg, which was very large. Well, that looks like a turkey egg. Maybe you've been tricked said the old duck. You should teach your other children to swim before they are too old. If you wait, they will be too afraid to jump in the pond. Leave this other egg for a while and come back after a swim to see if it is hatched. Well, no, I, I cannot leave my baby duckling until he or she hatches. I am sure it will not be too long before it does, and the others will learn to swim without a problem, insisted the mother duck. Well, the old duck decided to sit with the mother duck while she waited for the big egg to hatch. The next day, the big egg shook and cracked, and the last baby duckling waddled out of the broken eggshell. The old duck and the mother duck looked at the last baby duckling with great surprise. She looked nothing like the other ducks. In fact, she did not really look like much of a duck at all. She was big, gray, ugly, and strange looking. Well, she certainly is an unusual looking duckling, said the old duck. Hmm, <sighs> said the mother duck. She must be so big and odd because she was in the egg for so long. She is rather pretty if you look at her a certain way, 
In time, I am sure she will grow into a proper looking duck. The mother duck led her children to the pond, and one by one, they all jumped in. The ugly gray duckling swam very well. Actually, she swam even better than the other ducklings. The mother duck was happily surprised. She was very worried that she might have been a poor swimmer because she was so big. But after their swim, the mother duck and her family went into the barnyard. All of the animals stopped in their tracks as soon as they noticed the ugly duckling. They began to come up to her and tease her. One young duck even bit her. A hen came and grabbed some of the ugly duckling's feathers in her beak and pulled until the ugly duckling began to cry. And then all of the animals began to sing and laugh. Look, look, hear, hear, ho, ho, boo, hoo, see the ugly duckling cry. Look, look, hear, hear, ho, ho, boo, hoo, see the ugly duckling cry. Her neck is too long, her feathers are dry. You leave her alone, said the mother duck. She's not hurting anyone. Yes, but she is just so big and ugly that she should be forced to leave the farm so that we don't have to look at her, said the duck who had bitten the ugly duckling. <gasps> Don't say that, shouted the mother duck. She may not be pretty, but she is very kind and sweet and a very good swimmer. As a matter of fact, she swims even better than her brothers and sisters, and I think that in time she will become smaller and prettier. Just leave her alone. Even though her mother tried to make them all see that she was a good duck, the next few days were terrible for the ugly duckling. The other animals of the farmyard did not obey the mother duck's order to leave the ugly duckling alone. Instead, they became even meaner to the ugly duckling, and soon her brothers and sisters began to tease her too. Eventually, her mother became too tired to defend her anymore. And so, one night, the ugly duckling snuck away from the farm into the great wide world. She traveled a long, long way until she finally found a huge field and fell asleep. In the morning, the ugly duckling awoke to find herself surrounded by several wild ducks. One of the ducks began to tease her for being so ugly. Another duck told her, It's okay that you are so ugly, as long as you don't marry into our family. The ugly duckling soon moved on. After traveling for a while, the ugly duckling found a gaggle of geese and stopped to look at them. She hoped that she might be able to join them. As she approached, she heard a loud bang, bang. Two geese fell dead to the ground. In the distance, the ugly duckling saw some men with hunting rifles. Oh, she got very scared and decided to run away from the geese. She ran and ran until she was very far away and very tired. She could hardly breathe from running so fast. She stopped and turned around. She could no longer see the geese, but she realized that she was standing next to a beautiful lake. She saw the most beautiful birds that she had ever seen gliding on the surface of the lake's clear blue water. They had long necks and soft white feathers. Oh, those pretty birds will never allow me to join them or swim with them. They're so beautiful and I am so ugly, thought the ugly duckling. Suddenly, the beautiful birds noticed the ugly duckling and swam toward the edge of the lake where she was standing. One of them said, Hello, young swan. Where did you come from? Me? Said the ugly duckling in surprise. Well, I came from a place that is very far away. I don't know what a swan is, but I am a duck. What is a swan? <laughs> the beautiful birds began to laugh. <laughs> what is a swan? 
Like, we are swans, and so are you. You are not a duck. <laughs> Imagine you as a duck. A swan would make a very funny looking duck. But you are the most beautiful young swan here. Come live with us and we will raise you. I'm a swan! I am beautiful! Rejoiced the swan who was no longer an ugly duckling. Finally, I am accepted, the swan thought to herself joyfully. And the young swan lived among the other swans happily ever. For more songs and stories, check out our other videos. The Three Little Pigs Once upon a time, there were three little pigs named Penelope, Paul, and Peter. The pigs lived together in a creaky, leaky, eensy, weensy, moldy old shack. One night, while the pigs were sleeping, the old ceiling started to crack and boom! Peter's hammock fell on Paul's hammock, and Paul's hammock fell on Penelope's hammock, and all the little pigs fell down on the floor. That's it, said Peter. This old shack is falling apart. It's time that we each get our own houses, strong houses that won't fall apart. The three little pigs decided they would each build new, stronger houses of their own. The first little pig loved to play games, so she decided to build her house out of playing cards. The second little pig was a baker, so he decided to build his house out of his very favorite food in the world, cotton candy. The third little pig was a construction worker. He knew all about building strong houses, and he decided to build his house out of bricks. That night, the big bad wolf came creeping up to Penelope Pig's house and knocked on her door. Little pig, little pig, let me in, said the wolf. Penelope thought surely the wolf had come to gobble her up. Not by the hair on my chinny chin chin, she cried. And then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in, said the wolf. The house of cards wasn't strong enough. The big bad wolf huffed and puffed and blew the house down. Whoosh! Penelope ran and ran until she came to her brother's cotton candy house. The wolf wants to gobble me up, said Penelope. Don't worry, he won't be able to get us in here, said Paul. Outside, the big bad wolf came creeping up to Paul Pig's house and knocked on the door. Little pigs, little pigs, let me in, said the wolf. Not, Not by, by the, the hair, hair on our chinny chin, chin chins, cried the pigs. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in, said the wolf. The house of cotton candy wasn't strong enough. The big bad wolf huffed and puffed and blew the house down. Whoosh! Penelope and Paul ran and ran until they came to their brother's brick house. The wolf is trying to gobble us up, cried Paul. Don't worry, he won't be able to get us in here, said Peter. Outside, the big bad wolf came creeping up to Peter Pig's house and knocked on the door. Little pigs, little pigs, let me in, said the wolf. Not, Not by, by the, the hair on our chinny chin chins, cried the pigs. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in, said the wolf. But the house of bricks was too strong for the wolf. 
No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't blow the house down. Mr. Wolf, you're not going to gobble us up today, said Peter proudly. Gobble you up? asked the wolf. I don't want to eat you. I just need a house where I can stay. The wolf explained to the pigs that he loved candles. When it was time for him to build a house of his own, he had made it out of wax. But the house of wax wasn't strong enough, and on a hot day, the wax house melted away. You're not really big and bad after all, said Penelope. Though I wish you had just asked to come in nicely instead of all that huffing and puffing business. The next day, Peter gathered materials to build strong new houses. Penelope's new house was going to be rectangular with hearts painted on it like a playing card. Paul's new house was going to be pink and round, just like cotton candy. And the wolf's new house was going to be tall and thin like a candle. Now that they each had their very own, very strong houses, the three little pigs and the big, not so bad wolf lived happily together in their homey, comfy, cozy new neighborhood. The end. <laughs> Hola, habla Yannick Sabravo. Voy a leer El lobo con piel de oveja para las fábulas de Osopo. Un lobo encontró gran dificultad en acercarse a las ovejas por la vigilancia del pastor y sus perros. Sin embargo, un día encontró la piel de una oveja que había sido tirada. Entonces puso la piel sobre su propio cuerpo y caminó tranquilamente entre las ovejas. Un cordero vio al lobo con la piel de oveja y creyendo que era una oveja, el cordero empezó a seguir al lobo. Y el lobo, después de guiar al cordero lejos del rebaño, pronto hizo una comida de él y por algún tiempo tuvo éxito en engañar las ovejas y disfrutar comidas ricas. Y de esta historia podemos aprender una lección importante. Las apariencias pueden engañar. Hi, this is Peter Jacobson. I'll be reading The Town Mouse and the Country Mouse by Aesop. Once upon a time, an ordinary country mouse invited his fancy cousin, the town mouse, for dinner. The town mouse hated the country with all of his heart, but he loved his cousin very much and agreed to come. The country mouse offered all his food freely, even though it was only a few small scraps of beans and bacon. The town mouse, though, was rather displeased with his supper and said, I cannot understand, cousin, how you can put up with such poor food as this. Can you not find anything better in all of the country? Come with me and I will show you how to live. When you have been in town a week, you will wonder how you could ever have been able to stand the country life. And with that, the two mice set off for the town and arrived at the town mouse's residence late at night. You will want some refreshments after our long journey, said the town mouse, as he took his friend into the grand dining room. There they found the remains of a fine feast, and soon the two mice were eating up turkey, fresh breads, jellies, and lavish cakes. Then, all of a sudden, in the middle of their grand meal, they heard growling and barking. W w what is that? said the country mouse, frightened at the unfamiliar noise. It's only the dogs of the house, answered the other. Only, cried the country mouse, I do not like that music at my dinner. Just then, the door flew open, and two huge, drooling dogs darted towards the mice. The cousins scampered away before the two dogs could make them into a feast of their own. Goodbye, cousin, said the country mouse. What, going so soon, said the other. Yes, he replied, better beans and bacon in peace than cakes and jelly in fear. The end. For more songs and stories, check out our other videos. I'm Judy Tenuta, the love goddess, and I will be reading The Ant and the Grasshopper. In a field one summer's day, a grasshopper was hopping about, chirping and singing to its heart's content. 
An ant passed by, hauling along with great toil and ear of corn, he was taken to the nest. Why not come and play with me, said the grasshopper, instead of toiling and moiling in that way? I'm helping to save up my food for the winter, said the ant, and I recommend you do the same. Why worry about winter, said the grasshopper. We got plenty of food for now. But the ant went on its way and continued its toil. When the winter came, the grasshopper had no food and found itself dying of hunger. Oh, while every day it saw the ants eating corn and grain from the stores they had collected in the summer. And the moral of the story is, it is best to prepare before you despair. Oh! Hi, this is Chaz Palmentary. I'll be reading Jack and the Beanstalk by Joseph Jacobs. Once upon a time, there was a poor widow who lived in a little cottage with her son Jack. One day, the widow sent her son to the market to sell their cow so they could have some money. But on the way, Jack met a man who offered him some beans in exchange for the cow. Jack took the beans, but when he got home, his mother was very upset that he brought them beans instead of money. Jack said that they could plant the beans to grow food, but his mother did not feel any better. Jack planted the beans anyway. The next morning, a great huge beanstalk appeared where Jack had planted the beans. Jack wanted to climb the beanstalk to see where it led. And so he said goodbye to his mother and up the stalk he went. He climbed and climbed until he was in the clouds. Finally, he reached an enormous green valley in the sky. When he climbed into the grassy surface, he immediately saw a huge castle. Then he noticed an old woman nearby. Jack approached the woman and said, Hello, madam, is this your home? No, said the old lady, but I can tell you the story of the castle. Once upon a time, there was a noble knight who lived in that castle, which is on the border of Fairyland. He and his wife and the children were liked by all their neighbors. One day an evil giant attacked the castle and took away the man and his children, but the wife and the youngest child were not at home. They were visiting an old nurse. When the news of the giant's attack reached the wife, she knew she had to stay with the nurse to protect her son and herself. Eventually, the old nurse passed away, and the woman and her son continued to live at the nurse's house, but they became very poor. The giant and his wife moved into the castle and still live there today. Now, I will tell you who the woman and her son are. The son is you, and the woman is your mother, and that castle belongs to your father. You must take it back from the giant for you and your mother to own. Jack was shocked. My poor mother, he said. Do you have the courage to fight the giant, asked the old woman. I must have the courage to do what is right, said Jack. Good. Now, to defeat the giant, you must enter the castle, and if possible, take the hen that lays the golden eggs and the harp that speaks. Remember, you are not stealing because everything in the castle belongs to you and your family. Then, suddenly, the woman vanished and Jack realized that she was a fairy. Jack ran to the castle and ran to the bell. The giant's wife opened the door. She looked down and saw Jack and grabbed him and dragged him into the castle. Then she told Jack that he was to be her servant and to help her with her chores, but that when her husband was home, he would have to hide in the closet so that he would not eat him. Just then, Jack heard a loud thump on the stairs, and a booming voice called out, fee fi fo fum I smell the breath of an Englishman. Let him be alive or let him be dead. I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Wife, cried the giant, there is a man in this castle. Let me have him for breakfast. 
But the giant's wife shouted back that he was wrong and that no one was in the castle. Later, the giant left for a walk, and Jack helped the giant's wife with all her many chores around the huge castle. That evening, the giant returned for supper, and Jack hid in the closet. He watched as the giant and his wife sat at the dining table, and he saw that at the giant's feet was a hen. A few minutes later, the hen laid a golden egg, and Jack realized that this was the hen that the fairy had told him to take. So, when the giants had gone to sleep, he snuck into the dining room and snatched the hen. Then, just as he was leaving the room, he noticed a large bag of golden coins sitting on the serving table, and he remembered that the fairy had said that everything in the castle belonged to him and his mother. So he took the bag as well, he rushed out of the castle and down the beanstalk to his mother's house. Jack woke his mother and showed her the hen and the bag of gold and told her about the giants. She was shocked and happy for the gold and the hen, which would save them from being poor. But she wanted Jack to stay and not return to the castle. But Jack convinced her that he must go back and fight for their family's castle. Jack snuck back into the castle and back into the closet before the giants awoke. The next day, the giants and the giantess had their breakfast, and afterwards the giant lay down and said, Wife, bring me my harp, and I will listen to some music while you take a walk. The giantess returned with a beautiful harp, which sparkled with diamonds and rubies, and had gold strings. The giant looked at the harp and said, Play. And the harp played a very beautiful lullaby, for this was the giant's nap time. Once the giant was asleep, and the giant's wife went out to take a walk, Jack crept out of the closet and quickly and silently grabbed the harp and started to dash away from the sleeping giant. But the harp began to shout, Help, master! I am being stolen. Jack told the harp that he was the son of the knight who owned the castle, and the harp stopped shouting, but it was too late. The giant was already awake and chasing them. Jack ran out of the castle and all the way down the beanstalk to his mother's home. He grabbed an axe from their woodshed and cut down the beanstalk. And the giant, who was following them down the stalk, fell to the ground and broke his neck. Then the old fairy appeared and took Jack and his mother back to the castle by magic. Jack rang the doorbell, and the giant's wife, who was worried about her missing husband, came running and fell and broke her neck and died. And so Jack and his mother moved back into their castle and lived happily ever after. Hi, this is Alex McCord and Simon Van Kempen. We'll be reading Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson, and we'd like to dedicate this to our sons, Francois and Johan. Jim Hawkins was an apprentice pawnbroker in the British colony of Antigua in the Caribbean. One day, Mr. Johansson, the pawnbroker, came into the store carrying a big, heavy trunk. The trunk was old and rusted, and it seemed like it was covered in dust or sand. What's that? It looks like a box of old junk. Old? Definitely. Junk? Well, that's for you to figure out. Mr. Johansson dumped the chest on a bench. This is from that old widow, Mrs. Blue. With her husband gone, she figured it was time to sort out his belongings. I told her you'd have an appraisal of its worth for her by the end of the week. Jim sighed after Mr. Johansson left. 
Mr. Johansson was a kind man and a good boss, but Jim wanted more for his life than following in his footsteps. He wanted to walk on sand no other foot had ever imprinted before. He wanted adventure. He had been appraising objects from the chest when he came across something that didn't seem to belong with all the assorted trinkets and odds and ends. It looked like a scrap of paper, yellowed with age and rolled up tightly. As he unfurled it, he saw a picture of a chain of nearby islands. On one of those islands, there was a large red X. Though Jim had never seen anything like this before, he knew what it was. It was a treasure map. Jim knew that this was his opportunity to have a real adventure. Mr. Blue must have been none other than Bluebeard the pirate, fearsome predator of the seas. He brought the map to Mr. Johansson and explained his theory. Mr. Johansson said nothing, but instead closed the shop, rolled up the map, and grabbing Jim by the arm led him down to the harbor. Once there, he looked up and down the docks, though Jim hadn't the faintest clue what he was looking for. Finally, they stopped in front of a ship. This one looks sturdy, and the captain looks like he's seen his fair share of sailing of his day. Indeed, the captain looked hardened with experience and salted by the spray of the sea. We'd like you to take us out to these islands, Mr. Johansson told the captain, pointing to his map. The captain's eyes widened with recognition when he saw the map, but he said nothing of it. Instead, he asked, What business do you have on those islands? No one goes there anymore. That's private. Just know that you'll be handsomely compensated once our business is done. The captain smiled a grim smile. Don't worry, he said. I have no doubt I'll get paid. All aboard and we'll set sail immediately. They had sailed long into the night when Jim and Mr. Johansson decided it was time to head to their cabin below deck and get some sleep. When they woke up, they discovered their map gone and the door to their cabin barricaded from the outside. We've got to get out of here. Jim screamed. It looks like there's only one way out of this room. Help me loosen the store. Together, they managed to push the door open and get back up on deck. What are you doing out of your room? The captain asked, clutching the map tightly in his hand. Well, no matter. It just saves me the trouble of having to fetch you. Why did you lock us up? What do you want from us? Jim asked. The name's Long John Silver, the captain explained. And I'm the meanest pirate in all the seven seas. Or at least I was. Old Bluebeard found a fortune and treasure. But when I tried to steal it off of him, he wound up destroying my ship and marooning most of my crew. He left me with nothing. I had to build myself back up again from scratch. But this map... He continued. ...shows where he buried that treasure. And neither you nor anyone else is going to get in my way. Captain, land a hole! Said a crewman from the crow's nest. Ah, oh, we're close to the treasure. Time to get rid of ya. The pirate forced Jim and Mr. Johansson onto the ship's emergency dinghy and began to sail towards land. Jim, how well do you remember that map? Mr. Johansson asked as they were bobbing up and down in the little wooden raft. Like the back of my hand? He replied. Why? I have an idea. Mr. Johansson removed his large puffy white shirt. Hold the other end of this. He explained to Jim. And we'll use it like a sail. Our boat is much smaller and weighs less. So maybe, just maybe, we'll get to the island before them. Sure enough, their little boat flew across the waves and they landed on the beach with time to spare. Now we get to work. Do you remember where that treasure is buried? Mr. Johansson asked. Well, yes, moaned Jim. Well, as I recall, it was through the woods and 50 paces west at a group of three trees. Excellent, cried Mr. Johansson. They ran through the woods until they found the trees. Locating a sharp stone, they managed to cut the trees down and cover the land with dirt and leaves, so it appeared as though the trees were never there. Then they continued on to the treasure and dug it up with their bare hands. Then they fashioned a sled out of sticks and palm fronds and pulled the big iron treasure chest along on it so that it wouldn't leave telltale tracks in the dirt. They waited with their treasure in a hidden part of the tree line for Long John Silver to land. They watched from a distance as he and all his men ran off the boat, practically tripping over their own feet down the beach and into the jungle in search of the treasure. So great was Silver's desire to find it that he had every last man join the hunt, leaving his ship unguarded. Dragging their booty behind them, Jim and Mr. Johansson boarded the pirate's ship with their treasure and took off for home, leaving Silver only the beat-up dinghy. When they returned to their pawn shop, they sent word to Mrs. Blue to come by. 
they told her all about how her husband was Bluebeard the Pirate and showed her the treasure they had unearthed. The three of them decided to split it evenly, three ways. And Jim was able to live out the rest of his life rich in both treasure and adventure. The End Hola, habla Yanixa Bravo. Voy a leer El zorro y las uvas para las fábulas de Osopo. Un día caloroso de verano, un zorro caminaba por un huerto cuando llegó a un racimo de uvas madurándose, en una parra sobre su cabeza. Justo lo que necesito para calmar mi sed, dijo. Alejándose un poquito, Corrió y saltó, lo más alto que pudo, pero muy poco no alcanzó las uvas. Dándose la vuelta de nuevo, contando. Uno, dos, tres. Saltó, pero no tuvo más éxito. Vez tras vez lo intentó. Sin embargo, al final tuvo que rendirse. Mientras se alejaba, con la nariz al aire, dijo. Esas uvas estúpidas, a lo mejor son agrias de todas maneras. Y entonces, el zorro nos muestra una lección importante. Es fácil despreciar lo que no puedes lograr. Do your ears hang low? Do they wobble to and fro? Can you tie them in a knot? Can you tie them in a bow? Can you throw them over your shoulder like a continental soldier? Do your ears hang low? Do your ears stand high? Do they reach up to the sky? Do they droop when they're wet? Do they stiffen when they're dry? Can you wave them at your neighbor with a little bit of flavor? Do your ears stand high? Do your ears flip flop? Can you use them as a mop? Are they stringy at the bottom? Are they curly at the top? Can you flap them up and down as you fly around the town? Do your ears flip flop? Do your ears stick out? Can you waggle them about? Do they wave in the breeze from the smallest little sneeze? Can you cast a cooling shadow over most of Colorado? Do your ears stick out? For more songs and stories, check out our other videos. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus go round and round, all through the town. The wipers on the bus go swish, 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 swish. The wipers on the bus go swish, 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 all through the songs and stories, check out our other videos. For more songs and stories, check out our other videos. Hi, this is John Krasinski, and I'll be reading The Gingerbread Man. Once upon a time, an old woman and her husband lived alone in a little old house. One day, she decided to make her husband's favorite treat, gingerbread cookies. She carefully mixed the batter, rolled out the dough, and cut out a very nice gingerbread man. She added licorice for his hair, frosting for his clothes, and raisins for his eyes. What a fine-looking gingerbread man he was. After he was fully baked, she slowly opened the oven door, and poof, up jumped the gingerbread man. And he ran out of the door saying, run, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me, I'm the gingerbread man. The old woman and the old man ran after him, but they could not catch him. And so the gingerbread man ran and ran. While he was running, he met a cow. Moo, said the cow. You look very fine. 
find enough to eat. And the cow started to chase the little man. But the gingerbread man ran faster, saying, I ran away from an old woman, I ran away from an old man, and I can run away from you, I can. And he laughed. Run, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me, I'm the gingerbread man. The cow ran after the gingerbread man, but she could not catch him. The gingerbread man kept running, and soon he met a horse. Nay, said the horse, you look mighty tasty. I think that I would like to eat you. But you can't, said the gingerbread man. I ran away from an old woman, I ran away from an old man, I ran away from a cow, and I can run away from you, I can. And so he ran, singing, Run, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me, I'm the gingerbread man. The horse ran after the gingerbread man, but he too could not catch him. The gingerbread man ran and ran, laughing and singing. While he ran, he met a chicken. Cackle, cackle, said the chicken. You look fine enough to peck for dinner. I'm going to eat you, Mr. Gingerbread Man. But the gingerbread man just laughed. I ran away from an old woman. I ran away from an old man. I ran away from a cow. I ran away from a horse. And I can run away from you. I can. And so he ran, singing, Run, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. The chicken ran after the gingerbread man. But alas, she too could not catch him. And so the gingerbread man was safe again. Nobody can catch me, he thought. So he kept on running until he met a fox. He just had to tell the fox how he ran faster than all the others. Mr. Fox, he said, as tasty as I appear to be, I cannot let you catch and eat me. I ran away from an old woman. I ran away from an old man. I ran away from a cow. I ran away from a horse. I ran away from a chicken. And I can run away from you. I can. But Mr. Fox did not seem to care. Why would I want to bother you? asked Mr. Fox. You don't even look that tasty. No, young man, I don't want to eat you at all. The gingerbread man was so relieved. Well, indeed, Mr. Fox, said the gingerbread man. If you don't mind, I think I'll take a little rest here. And the gingerbread man stopped running and stood still. And right when he stood still, snap went Mr. Fox's jaws right into the gingerbread man, who was no longer a man. Just dessert. The end. Hi, this is Mark Thompson. I'll be reading The Boy Who Cried Wolf. There was once a shepherd boy who grew bored as he sat on the hillside watching the village sheep. To amuse himself, he cried out, Wolf! Wolf! There's a wolf chasing the sheep! The villagers came running up the hill to help the boy drive the wolf away. But when they arrived at the top, there was no wolf in sight. The boy laughed at the sight of their angry faces. You shouldn't cry wolf, shepherd boy, the villagers said, when there is no wolf. Then they went grumbling back down the hill. Later, the boy sang out again. Wolf! Wolf! The wolf is chasing the sheep! And to his naughty delight, the villagers all came running up the hill again to help him scare the wolf away. But when the villagers saw there was no wolf, they said to the boy, Save it for when something is actually wrong. Don't cry wolf when there is no wolf. But the boy just grinned and watched them go grumbling down the hill once more. Later, he saw a real wolf prowling about his flock. Alarmed, he leapt to his feet and called out as loudly as he could. Wolf! Wolf! But the villagers thought he was trying to fool them again, and so they didn't come. At sunset, everyone wondered why the shepherd boy hadn't returned to the village with their sheep. They went up the hill to find the boy and saw that he was crying. There was really a wolf this time. The flock has been scattered. I cried, wolf, why didn't you come? An old man tried to comfort him as they walked back to the village. We'll help you look for the sheep in the morning, he said, putting his arm around the boy's shoulders. Nobody believes a liar, even when he's telling the truth. The End
For more songs and stories, check out our other videos. Hi, this is Lisa D. Simone. I'll be reading The Little Red Hen by Joseph Jacobs. There once was a farm with a big red barn. And in that big red barn, there lived many animals, the smallest of which was a little red hen. The little red hen may have been little, but she was the most active resident of the farm. When she wasn't laying eggs, she spent her time clucking and walking around the barn, pecking at the seeds on the ground, or gathering up twigs and hay to make her nest. She kept everything in the barn tidy and clean. One day, while she was pecking at the ground, she discovered some leftover wheat grains that the farmer had left behind. She knew that the wheat could be planted and then made into delicious fresh bread. So she went to the pigsty where the pig was eating from a bucket of slop. Ah, uh, excuse me. I need someone to help me plant this wheat, said the little red hen. Not I, said the pig as he went back to his slop. So the little red hen went outside and found the cat lying in the sun and playing with a ball of yarn. Will you help me plant this wheat? said the little red hen. Meow, said the cat. Not I. Can't you see that I'm busy? Meow. The little red hen was frustrated, but she did not give up. She walked all the way out to the pond, where the duck was lazing around in the cool water. Will you help me plant this wheat? said the little red hen. Quack, quack, not I. Maybe I will help you later when I'm finished with my swim, said the duck. Quack, quack, then I will do it myself, said the little red hen. So the little red hen went off on her own, out to the field, and found a nice spot to plant the wheat. When she was finished, she went back to the barn to rest. Soon, when the wheat had grown tall and golden yellow, the hen became excited to make bread from it. But first, she had to harvest it. Who will help me cut the wheat? asked the little red hen. Not I! oinked the pig, who was lying in some mud. Not I, meowed the cat, who was taking a cat nap. Not I, quacked the duck, as he waddled back to the pond. Quack, quack, then I will do it myself, said the little red hen. After she cut the wheat, the little red hen was tired, but she knew that the wheat had to be taken to the mill so it could be ground into flour. Uh, who will help me mill this wheat? asked the little red hen. Not I, oinked the pig. Not I, meowed the cat. Not I, quacked the duck. Then I will do it myself, said the little red hen. Once the wheat had been ground into flour, the little red hen knew it was time to bake the bread. Black, who will help me bake the bread? She asked, although she already predicted what the answer would be. Not I, oinked the pig. Not I, meowed the cat. Not I, quacked the duck. Then I will do it myself, said the little red hen. So she made the flour into a loaf of bread and put it into the oven. Then she sat and rested. Soon, as the bread became hot and soft, the air filled with the sweet smell of freshly baked bread. The pig and the cat and the duck all came running into the big red barn. Uh, who will help me eat this bread? Who will help me eat this bread? said the little red hen. I will, oinked the pig. I will, meowed the cat. I will, quacked the duck. Well, 
Uncle said to him. Did you help me plant the wheat? And did you help me harvest the wheat? What the heck? And did you help me mill the wheat? And did you help me bake the bread? The other animals all shook their heads no. Then I will eat the bread myself, said the little red hen. And she did. The end. Hi, this is Upen Patel, and I'll be reading The King's Son and the Painted Lion. A king had a dream in which he watched as his only son was killed by a lion. So scared was the king that his dream was a prediction of the future that he put him in his specially made palace far away from all the dangers of his dream. In order to keep his son entertained, he adorned the walls of the palace with paintings of all the animals that lived safely outside the palace's walls. Among these paintings was a picture of a lion. Abandoned and alone in his palace, he grew to despise the lion. One day, he stood in front of the picture and yelled at it. Stupid lion, if you hadn't halted my father's dream, I'd be free instead of being stuck in this palace. He picked up a heavy hammer and swung at the lion. The wall collapsed, crushing the sun under its weight. When the word of his son's death reached the king, he knew he was responsible. In working to stop one outcome, he invited another. And so with great sorrow, he learned that it is better to face one's fate with bravery than to try to escape it. Hey, this is Nick Cannon, and I'll be reading Anansi Tries to Steal All the Wisdom of the World. Anansi, which means spider in the African language of Akan, prided himself on being clever, but knew that he was not very wise. So one day he came up with the clever idea to become wise easily. He picked up a hollow gourd and thought to himself, if I fill this gourd with wisdom, then I can keep it all to myself, and I'll be wiser than anyone in the world. Excited about his new scheme, he went from door to door asking for advice and wisdom. He thought he was being clever by stealing everyone's wisdom, but everyone he met happily shared their advice with him, for they could see that Anansi needed wisdom more than anybody. Finally, when he had filled his gourd with all the advice, ideas, and wisdom he could carry, he scuttled back to his home excitedly. But then he had a thought. What if someone else comes and tries to steal all my wisdom? He decided that he would hide his wisdom in a safe place. So he saw a tall tree and figured that it would be a good hiding spot. He clutched the gourd close to his body with two of his legs and tried to use the other six to climb the tree. But the gourd was too big. Every time he went to try to climb the tree, the gourd got in his way. Just as he was growing frustrated, his young son came by and said, why don't you just tie the gourd to your back, Daddy? His son's wise words made Anansi realize that wisdom was best used if shared with others. So he tied the gourd to his back, climbed up to the very top of the tree, and held the gourd up to the sky. All of the wisdom in the gourd spilled out into the wind and flew away far and wide. And that is how wisdom came to the land. The end. Hi, this is Simon Van Kempen. And Alex McCord. And we are going to read Five Little Monkeys. And I really want to dedicate this to our boys, Francois. And Johan. Who have enjoyed this poem for many years, and they're only four and six. Five little monkeys jumping on the bed. One fell off and bumped his head. Mama called the doctor, and the doctor said, 
No more monkeys jumping on the bed. Four little monkeys jumping on the bed. One fell off and bumped his head. Mama called the doctor and the doctor said, No more monkeys jumping on the bed. Three little monkeys jumping on the bed. And one fell off and bumped his head. Mama called the doctor and the doctor said, No more monkeys jumping on the bed. Two little monkeys jumping on the bed. One fell off and bumped his head. Mama called the doctor and the doctor said, No more monkeys jumping on the bed. One little monkey jumping on the bed. He fell off and bumped his head. Mama called the doctor and the doctor said, No more monkeys jumping on the bed. No little monkeys jumping on the bed. None fell off and bumped his head. Mama called the doctor and the doctor said, Put those monkeys back in bed. The end. For more songs and stories, check out our other videos. Hi, this is Simon, Francois, Johan den Kempen, and we'll be reading The North Wind and the Sun, written by Aesop. A long time ago, the sun and the north wind would argue over who was the greatest power in the universe. Each one thought that they were the strongest and most powerful person in the world. The sun would say, I'm the most powerful because I can warn the whole world. But the north wind argued, I am the most powerful because I can blow mighty ships at sea. I say we sell this once and for all, said the sun. And so the sun shined with all its might, and the north wind blew as hard as it could, but neither could tell who was stronger because it was too bright and windy for either one to see. Together they agreed they would have to settle it with a test. Quickly they looked around for something to test their strength on. Below them was a man travelling along the road through the mountains. He was wearing a heavy coat, which he buttoned up tightly. The sun and the north wind decided the winner would be the first one who would get the travelling man to take his coat off. The north wind tried his power first, blowing with all his might down the road. But the stronger he blew his cold and bellowing winds, the tighter the shivering man held his coat around his body. At last, exhausted, the north wind gave up. OK, I may have not been able to make him take off that coat, said the north wind. But what makes you think you can do any better? If I can do it, no one can! We'll see about that, said the sun. The sun beamed a friendly smile down at the travelling man, shining on him with his light and warmth. The travelling man immediately took off his coat and basked in the warm sunlight. The traveller looked up at the sun and smiled at the beautiful weather the sun had provided. And so the sun taught the north wind an important lesson. Always be kind and warm to others. Hi, my name is Ariane Smith, and I'm reading Bedtime for Peter. He loved to be read to most of all, something Dad did until he was tall. Read me a story demanded the pajama-clad lad. Something mysterious, but please not too sad. Can we go to a land? A faraway place? Maybe an island or somewhere in space. So armed with the volume, Dad sat by Peter's bed, painting pictures so vibrant they stuck in his head. There was Orgoglio the giant, the sweetest of all, with a heart as big, as big as he was tall. When Orgoglio stood up, the clouds tickled his head, and an entire continent made for his bed. But that's not all. The stories had more. They were filled with great fantasy, adventures galore. There were fairies and monsters, forests and fields, queendoms with kitchens and places so real. But the thing that Peter loved most of all 
was having Dad read to him until he was tall. The end. Welcome to Speakaboos. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. Let's read together. Hickory dickory dock, the mice go up the clock. The sun would say, I'm the most powerful because I can ruin the whole world. Sing together. Wheels on the bus go round and round, all through the town. For it's one, two, three stripes you're out at the old ball game. And learn together. Leopards and cheetahs have spots. Inspire a love of reading with kids' favorite stories. Speakaboos, 